uh, just we'll just go ahead and start now. Just go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, tell us about your journey with dogs and how you ended up with uh, the Bulldogs. Yeah, so um, so my name is Karen Lucciardi. Um, I live in Ocala, Florida. Uh, I've been down in Florida since 1988. Um, I moved down here from Wisconsin. I was born and raised up, up north. Um, I've done horses and dogs my entire life, uh, raised, training, breeding horses and dogs my whole life. Um, my parents and I did uh, Maltesas and Doram and Pinchers and Pekingeses when I was growing up. Um, we bred hundreds of horses, so I was certainly been inundated with animals my whole life. Um, so, but I really love the bulldog, and the reason why is because it could be on my farm down here in Florida without having to worry about um, the heat, you know. That was probably how I ended up with the old English bulldog um, because it was such an athletic, versatile breed um, that was able to, to take the heat and be outside all day. So that's really how I ended up getting into the breed. And then I wanted to, um, I noticed after doing lots of research because I've bred hundreds of horses, um, I really wanted to breed my own. And so since I I'd, I'd had a very su successful career in the horse world, I thought, well, maybe I could show some dogs. So, um, and I realized how hard it is to breed dogs to make a quality animal extremely, extremely difficult. Um, and so probably about 16 years in, I met a wonderful lady named Karen Beal. Um, she has been my mentor and my best friends for almost 17 years now. Uh, she's really been the one that, that helped me uh, uh, better my breed. Um, teach me all the tiny little intricacies and there was no baloney with her. I think that's what I loved about her. She was straightforward, right to the point. Um, no bullshit. Gave me it, gave me it straight. And I love that. Um, and there was nothing in it for her necessarily. So, um, and then I got really lucky because she, uh, basically retired because she couldn't, um, continue. She had some health issues that was, that was hindering her ability to keep breeding. And she never bred for money ever. She had a job and her breeding, um, was literally to better the breed. She gave away puppies. She gave away her dogs. It had nothing to do with money at all for her whatsoever. Um, but I was fortunate enough because we were like-minded people. So her and I basically, uh, uh, put our heads together to make the dogs better, um, more athletic, more health testing, um, and more of, uh, of what I think the old English bulldog is supposed to be, which is supposed to be a tight skin dog, um, medium size. I do not believe in a hundred pound dog. Um, the larger the dog, the shorter the lifespan. It's just a fact. So her dogs were medium, minor medium, meaning the males are, uh, 75 to 85 pounds, 17 to around 19 inches tall. And the females are 55 to 60. Um, not to say you couldn't have something bigger. I mean, that's fine. But um, in my program, I should try to shoot for medium sized dogs. That's what I do. So yeah, so um, that's, that's important. I do have some smaller dogs that, that I do breed. Um, obviously, they're not show dogs, they're smaller. Uh, I do have some people that just don't want a big dog. They really prefer to have a small dog. And it's fine, to, I think, to have a 15-inch dog as long as it passes all the health tests. Um, I do do um, uh, all health testing on all my dogs at Animal Genetics in Tallahassee. I run a three panel um, on the three most common health issues that dogs have. I do hips and elbows on my dogs. Um, I also do tracheas. I do x-rays of tracheas and I do OFA. Um, again, it's not a guarantee. I never said it was, and this is absolutely true. You can actually call, um, animal genetics and they will tell you it's not a guarantee, but at least it gives you a good marker for what you're doing in your program and how to, to breed. Let's say, um, you don't want to breed two dogs together that have the same genetic issue. Let's say HUU, for example, you do not want to breed those two dogs together because then you're dramatic increasing your chances of those dogs having HUU. So um, can you still have dogs that are health tested clear? Absolutely. And still produce a puppy that has a problem? Absolutely. But it does decrease your chances dramatically. 
So I'm known for being um, the athletic rear breeding dog. I like rears on my dogs. To me, I have some of the best angulation, best hind ends. Um, I'm proud of that uh, because it's formed to function. The dogs need to function and longevity is a massive part of my program. Uh, getting eight years out of your dog does not make me happy. That's not uh, gonna, gonna work in my program. I need dogs to be 12, 13 years. Um, and my red line has that, uh, I've buried probably, gosh, I'm not sure, probably 15, 16 dogs that live to be 13, 14, 15 years old off the red line. So again, long living line, they're a very tight skin dog. Uh, they have medium like noses, um, excellent eyes, uh, and, and you want minimal wrinkles on the face and the body. Um, and that's, that to me is what's very important in the old English bulldog, uh, breed. Yeah, for sure. That's, uh, that's interesting. So I know today there's a, um, movement for a bigger, um, more, um, you know, mastiff looking type bulldog. What has been some of the, um, response to your dogs with the rear angulation? Do you see some people trying to, uh, use some of your dogs for some help? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I'm kind of, um, learned my lesson the hard way. Um, unfortunately I had a lot of people that I helped and unfortunately they gave me a real serious kick in the ass. Um, and I love helping people. I love helping people. I love guiding people, but don't kick me in the ass on the way out the door. Really? I mean, I don't even want to thank you. So I've learned, unfortunately, the hard way that I stay in my lane. I keep my nose out of out of other people's business and I don't allow breeding rights in my dogs. I just don't. I just don't. It's the major problem with breeding right people is the pro major problem in any breed of dog, especially bulldogs, is that everybody has a different idea, right, about what they think is important and what they think is not important in a breed quality dog. You have three types of dogs. You have a show dog, a breed quality dog, and you have a pet, right? So for me, I'm trying to hit the highest marker, okay? I don't want an excellent stud dog. I need a knock down, drag out, absolutely stunningly, unbelievably awesome stud dog that when you look at him, you go, holy man, that is an amazing dog. So I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to hit good or excellent. I want to be further than that. That's my standard. And my best friend and partner, Karen Beal, always gets mad at me. She's like, that's a really nice dog. I'm like, nope, doesn't have the rear I like. Down the road it goes. You know, and the only way that you do that, I will give everybody a tip on this. And I've done this time and time again. The only way that you make better dogs, dogs are not bought, they're made. And it takes years and years and years to do it. And the way that you do it is this. You have to keep a litter back, okay? When I did an inbreed of Brinks, I did uh, father to, to daughter breeding. Yep. I got 10 dogs out of that breeding. And I kept all 10 dogs out of that breeding. And interestingly enough, I waited until all 10 of those dogs, males and females, were a year and a half old before I made my pick, okay? Because what they look like at three months, at six months, and at a year, I'm just telling you, is very different what they look like at a year and a half old. And the reason why is because technically it is a mixed breed, right? It is. Let's face it. It is a mixed breed. David Levitt threw all those breeds together. And he line bred that down to make the, the old English bulldog. Now, depending on what direction or what you put in the line, you're going to pull it out. But unfortunately, um, the best results that I've gotten has been my inbreed, line breeding, and tightly breed. And so, I mean, I had two males that were awesome. I showed the one male uh, off of my inbreed from Brinks and a Brinks daughter. Um, now remember Karen had been breeding that line 17 years before me. Okay. So it wasn't like I did an inbreed just out of the whim of the, the, the seat of the, the seat of my pants here. Right. So Karen had bred that 17 years before me. And then I put another 15 years into it. So I've got, you know, 30 some, you know, you know 28 years into that line before I decided to do an, an, an inbreed in that particular one. So when I did that, I kept all 10 back and I 
only kept four dogs, four out of that inbreed that I felt like were a quality dog to keep back to breed and show. And the four that I kept, they'll knock your socks off. Absolutely awesome. Like fire. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. But you know how many people put that kind of work in? You know how many people put that kind of time in? How many people put that type of effort in? I, I champed out two of those dogs. I mean, they were show quality, but didn't have the rear. It was like neck and neck on these two males. And then I just actually posted up a picture of Brinks Jr. That was the one of the, the males that I, I posted that I kept because his brother was so close, but just not. And I could have sold that dog. I had many people make me offers of an ungodly amount of money. I sold him to a pet home uh, for a thousand dollars intact to my friend who would not use the dog. And that's what I do. And I'm not going to, I don't brag about that because I'm not rich by no means, but I don't trust people. And I've learned not to trust people. Sadly, I, I just have, especially in the bulldog world. So I promised Karen that in this line, um, and she doesn't care what I do. I mean, she's so awesome. They're my dogs and I can do whatever I want with them, but I feel responsible because it's, it was started her line 17 years ago. It's my line now, you know, come, going forward in the, in the next 18 years, 17, 18 years, it's my line going forward, but they wouldn't be the red run. The red line wouldn't be as good if it wasn't for Karen. So I just feel like I, there's just no way someone's going to get a hold of my red line and try to uh, do something because they're going to wreck it. It'll take one breeding to ruin my red line. One breeding. It, it, it'll be a, it'll be because when you do a direct outcross, you're throwing shit at the wall to see if it sticks. And that's a fact. You can take two champion dogs and put them together and you have no idea what the outcome is going to be. So you have to be willing to be able to get rid of the whole entire litter, scrap it and start again. And, and, or be able to call the dogs that, you know, are not going to be good back into our gene pool. Um, and, or make sure that you place the dogs in the pet homes if they don't have any health issues. So that to me is really, really important. Um, and Karen and I have always had that same like-minded, um, interest. That's why we work so well together. So, yeah. So yes, the answer your question, uh, people want my red line, but it's, they're, they're not going to get it. Not knowingly anyways. No, no, not with papers. No. Yeah. Interesting. Um, do you, um, do you ever foresee, uh, the bulldog world, um, kind of, um, revamping itself because of the economy that we have today. Um, I know that there's a lot of people who are having uh, harder times uh, getting their puppies into people's hands for the prices that they're looking for, and um, it's leaving them uh, questioning um, their breeding decisions and if they even want to breed at all. Do you, do you, th do you think in the long run that, that is uh, a good thing for the bull bull breed uh, communities? Yeah. So uh, yeah, unfortunately, um, you know, I have a lot of friends that breed I, of, of even different breeds of dogs. Um, and yeah, the economy's definitely not good, but again, the people that end up, you know, having wait lists like myself and having no problem selling their puppies like myself are the people that are, that are doing right by the dog and they're able to stand behind their product and behind their dog. You know, when someone, when, what led me down the road to not give breeding rights is if I ask them the question and say, so if someone gives you the dog back, what are you going to do? And they're like, what? Give me the dog back. I don't want the dog back. I'm like, well, there you go right there. We're not friends anymore. Like you're not getting my dog because you're responsible for that dog for the life of the dog. So if that dog has an issue or they have a family emergency or the death in the family and the dog's five years old, you need to take the dog back, period, end of story. Not, oh, I can't, or I don't have room or whatever. No. And that's just my, it's my opinion. It's worth a nickel, but that's very important to me. And I think, unfortunately, with the old English bulldog, people think and thought that they were going to be able to breed naturally and they were going to sell them like hotcakes. And now I think because the market has been flooded and has been flooded, I think 
people now want quality. I mean, they, the people that come to me, they want a quality dog. Um, and so people out there are not spending the money on getting a quality dog. And that's why on my Facebook, I try to educate about structure, movement, and health, um, longevity. I mean, those are the things that I hit. There's plenty of cheap puppies out there, but bulldogs do have issues. Absolutely. Even old English bulldogs have issues. So you want to go to a breeder that's health testing their dogs for sure. And that doesn't mean you go to the vet and the vet just checks their heart and their ears and their eyes and listens to their lungs. And that's it because that's not a health tested dog. So, um, and then you have the other half of the people that say the health testing is a scam. It's not really worth it. And like I said, it's, it's only 70 to 80%, um, on the, on the panels that you run on your dog. Let's say for example, HUU or DM or CMR1, you know, it's, it's only, it's not like human testing. It's not, it is different, but again, as a breeder, I think you're responsible for trying to put the best dog you can back into the gene pool and the healthiest dog, because if you don't, the vets get rich. The people are sad because their dog lived to be seven. And that's terrible. That's not what David Levitz wanted. The dogs that die of heat stroke outside for five minutes. David Levitz didn't want that. The dogs that have anxiety in the back of the car and they die in the back of the car. David Levitz didn't want that. You know, so again, the bigger headed, bigger dogs out there live shorter. So, and people don't want them to look like pits either. Long noses, you know, really thin bone, um, you know, more of a pit looking dog. They don't want that either, but they don't want it to look like a, like a, like a, um, as I've seen a great Dane that's called a bulldog. It's crazy. And the problem again with it is that, and I have done it time and time again, is that you can't just take two dogs and have two champion dogs and think you're going to produce champions. <laughs> it's not that easy. If it was, and everybody would be doing it. It's really hard. It, it is, like I said, the, it's always shocking to me how when I breed two, when I put two dogs together and then I see the pups and then I see them at three months, I see them at six months and I see them at eight and a year. And it was not until a year and a half that, at, and I've done this 10 times, 12 times that I can think of off the top of my head that I kept the whole litter. It's expensive, but you want your program to get better or do you want to just sell puppies? What do you want to do? And that takes years. That's right. It takes years and it takes Karen Beal would, she'd take a dog to the vet and the vet would go hips are bad. And she put the dog down and she put the dog in the ground. She'd take another dog to the vet and x-ray the hips. And the vet would go, nope. And she put that dog in the ground and she'd do so forth and so on. And the vet would go, yep, these are, these are B hips, which are breed hips. And she'd go, okay, I could take it home. So again, I mean, you, you, it's a, breeding is hard, <laughs> incredibly hard, way harder than breeding horses. And you have to have the stomach for it. You have to have the money for it. You have to have the time for it. You have to have the facility for it. Um, the people that are, then I get this, asked this question all the time. Well, you're a big professional breeder. Yep, I am. I'm not a hobby breeder. I'm a, I have a big place. I'm a big breeder. Yep, I have a lot of dogs. But I also put all, all my effort, all my time, all my interest, all my money into making the best quality, highest structurally temperament personality that I can back into my gene pool. That's key. And the people that are just bought a couple of dogs and put them in their house and breed them together, those to me are the problem people. Why? Because they're not health testing. They're, they don't know what they're doing. They're, they don't know structure. Half of the people out there know, know somewhat about structure, but don't care and breed it anyways, right? The other half of the people know that their dogs have bad hips, but don't care. And they say, well, I, I paid $5,000 for this dog and I want to breed it. I don't care if you, if you paid 50000 for the dog. And I've told people this before, I wouldn't give you a nickel for that dog. That dog needs to go away. I mean, I've imported dogs from, from all over the world. Spent The last dog I got imported was $15,000. I gave the dog away because I wasn't going to put it back into my gene pool. I ate that money. So you have to be, you have to be willing to sacrifice money way further than, than making sure that you're producing the best quality dog that you can. And 
because it's so expensive to breed, because health testing and all of it is so expensive, people look at it as a money thing and they want to get their money out. But I don't do it like that. That's not the way I'm wired. And I'm not saying I'm right. I'm by no means. Okay. I'm just saying what I've done and what works for me and going forward um, in my program, this is how I've made and what I consider to be an amazing dog following and a lot of family members um, in my following that are happy. Cause I want, in the end, I want to make people happy. That makes me happy. That's my goal. I, uh, I look at some of this as a sociological thing as well. Like with, I think there's, um, on the consumer level, I look at myself as a consumer more than anything. And I think that, um, probably, 50, 60, maybe even 70% of the people that own Bulldogs today shouldn't own Bulldogs to be. The other major problem with it, and there's lots of major problems with another big piece to this um, that I've seen over the years, um, is that the vets that are out there are not educated on Bulldogs at all. And they have absolutely zero experience with breeding. And people think that they're going to start breeding and their vet's going to help them. <laughs> their vet, my four vets that I have, call when I call them, ask them a question, and this has happened to me, I can't even tell you how many times. If I've got a problem or a question, I'll call f- four different vets and get four different answers. Because they don't know. And they don't know this breed. They don't know bulldogs. So again, that's another major problem because unless they specialize in reproduction and they specialize in bulldogs, they can't help people, it, not only breeders, but just people, just pet owners in general. So that's another claim to fame for me is that I always tell people I'm, I'm, I'm not God, I'm not cocky, I'm just by experience alone, I'm your vet. Give me a shot at it first before you run to your vet because I'm going to try to help you because I have more knowledge than your vet. Um, and I can say that I, I, I know that sounds like arrogant, but it's not, um, only because I, I have a lot of dogs. I've been doing it a lot of years and my experience of this particular breed comes ahead of your vet as far as that part goes. So that's, that's another major problem is that the vets out there are all about money and they're not about helping you. And that's a, that's a major, that's a major problem. That's, and I have four, four really awesome vets. I mean, I'm, I'm really very fortunate that the, the vets that I have, the one that I have is a show dog person and he shows a lot of dogs, not just bulldogs, but many different breeds. So he's pretty, he's really awesome. So he's there. And then the other lady that I have, she actually does, she's a repo vet. So she does nothing but reproduction. So she's another really good one. And then I have another lady that is a vet and an attorney. <laughs> so it's like, I think I'll go to vet school and then I'll go to, I'll go to law school too. Like, yeah, okay. Yeah. She's brilliant. And then I have another guy that sort of does both. He's, he does vet school. He's gone to vet school. And then I have three friends that have actually graduated from vet school. And two of those friends never did a C-section and never, ever even did a spay in vet school. You believe that? I mean, my one vet, the first C-section he did ever was on my friend's dog on an experiment. Oh yeah, because he didn't even do a C-section in vet school. So again, that's another major problem is that people think, one, my vet's going to help me and they have no idea on reproduction unless they breed dogs themselves, then they're knowledgeable. And then two, they don't know this breed of dog. They talk about how little do they get any kind of learning, um, any kind of special education when it comes to the reproduction system and the breeding process of canines. And this is part of the reason why um, you see a lot of vets today who despise breeders. Uh, It's not just because uh, you see, they see the worst of the worst. It's just that it's also learn behavior because they don't get any kind of, they only get one side of it. They don't get, you know, they don't have uh, 
say a breeder come talk to them and talk to them about the process of what they go through and what they need in a vet and they don't have a reproduction vet an area or an animal genetic a canine geneticist to come talk to them to to talk about all of this sort of thing they have to go they have to become a vet and then go to these specialized courses to become a reproduction specialist in some or, or you know uh so i think that's part of the problem here and um we're reaping the benefits and it's not good benefits for that. So like for people that are conscious and somebody like yourself who, who, who's, who's runs a professional breeding program, you know, you have to have, look, you have, you have four vets that you, you say that to some, a buddy of mine who owns a couple of dogs, they're just pets. They're like four vets. What do you need for? You know what I mean? That, it, But it, you might need even need six, you know, it, it, you know what I mean? Because it's just it's just one of those things. And then you add the fact that the breeds that we love are, are so complex um, that it's hard for... And then there's a lot of neg negative feelings from veterinarians towards the bull breeds and the brachycephalic breeds, and it's it, that's becoming ever more evident today. Um, so again, it's just a, it's just one of those things that um, we have to educate ourselves probably more than than say a uh, you know a golden retriever breeder. Well, part, the other major problem, to answer your previous question, is that people think that it's easy to breed dogs. They just, they don't have a clue. And I've, I've helped a few people, a select few people through the breeding process. <laughs> and when they're done with it, they're like, Miss Karen, we are never doing this again. How do you do this? You have to be a little batshit crazy to keep doing it. I'm like, yep, that's right. I'm a little batshit crazy because I am, I love my, what I do, like I, I, this is like my life. It's, 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 it's what I've been doing my entire life. I didn't just decide, you know, at, at 25 years old or 30 years old, I'm going to start breeding animals. I, I didn't, I've been my, it's in my family. It's in my genes. It's in my genetics. I mean, this is what I've been doing. So that's a major problem is that they think that it's not, even if they've had animals and they grew up on a farm, like, oh, how hard can it be? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just, just when I say to them, I'm like, but so I, I, I pay somebody. Okay. Uh, I have a staff. I do have quite a staff. I pay somebody for nine days straight to do my night shifts. Okay. I set aside a thousand dollars and I pay somebody to stay up all night from 11 o'clock until seven in the morning and I get to sleep to watch my puppies. And so then when the, the guy would, you know, text me back and he's like, all oh, the puppies died. I'm like, did you stay up all night? Oh, you really meant that. Like you were serious about that. I'm like, yeah, I was serious about that. You have to watch them. She'll eat them. She'll sit on them. They're going to get cold. They're not going to get fed. There's so many things that can go sideways and they'll die. This is a hard breed to whelp, a very hard breed to whelp, unlike my Frenchies that are much easier. So I'm like, no, you. I meant that. So that's another thing is that um, the people that I've helped, they're like, we are, we're spaying her. We're never breeding her again. We're done. And so that's another major piece is that they just have no clue because us, and I'm guilty of it. I'm guilty. I don't tell anybody how hard it is. My, I tell, it's all rainbows and butterflies and puppy kisses and buddies. And it's good, 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 good. You know why? Because the, the people out there, they don't have a clue and they don't want to know. They just want their puppy at eight weeks old, cute and cuddly, and it's all good. They don't want to know all the stuff that went on to get that puppy there. And that's the thing that when I, I've helped people in the past, I'm like, so getting a quality dog, it's really hard. Getting the dog pregnant is really hard. Keeping her pregnant is really hard. Welping the litter is really hard. Advertising the litter is really hard. Raising the puppies up is really hard. Getting them sold is really hard. Dealing with the people is really hard. It's like all of it. It's not one thing. And so when somebody does it from beginning to end, they're like, we're never doing that again, Miss Karen. We're done. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I have a staff. I have my three children. 
and I have myself and yeah, it's a lot of work. And if you aren't ready for a lot of work, it, it, it's not for you, man. Even if you do one litter a year, it, it's a, it's a tough go. It's a rough go, especially when you have family, you know, I'm single divorce mama three. So I've had my children. Um, my last person hated dogs. It's a long boring story, but, um, yeah, so it's a tough go, you know, on a family situation to be able to have a lot of dogs breed and make it your business. It's a rough go. Yeah. But the benefit is I don't have anybody to tell me what to do. I make all the decisions and I like that. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, exactly, you know, um, when, that's part of the reason why, you know, I'm just going to do stud dogs. Um, and that's not an easy process keeping stud dogs, you know, uh, yeah. but, but, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not worried about that. I'm up for that challenge. But one of the things that, um, I feel like, um, where I, I push back a little bit is that w what part of the thing is, is like dogs are, uh, are so important to my family and, and it, in, in all my family, it's, it's just all different walks of life. You know what I mean? It's, it's my family that have been, you know, ne'er-do-wells to my family who've been successful. We, we've all, we all have a love for the canine. And one of the things that, that, uh, interests me the most is the canine culture of, the immigrants that came to this country and they weren't, um, they weren't wealthy people. They were working class people. And I'm, um, I'm a big proponent of, of working class values. And one of the things that, 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 uh, that bothers me about breeding today is two things that one is that people don't look at it as a business. And the other part is, is, um, that to be successful as a breeder, um, it, it, especially with bull breeds, um, there isn't enough people thinking outside the box where to be successful, you really, you really can't be a working class person. You gotta be somebody who is either have had somebody giving you a leg up and giving you help or somebody who has deep pockets that is doing it for the fun of it. And, and then unfortunately what ends up happening is the preservation side of it really kind of lacks is that they end up, um, you know, there's not enough good dogs getting into the hands of good people. And, and I understand with breeders like yourself, you've been burned too many times for you to take, as many risks that maybe you want to, but unfortunately, then that preservation side takes a takes a huge hit. So it's like this this damned if you do and damned if you don't kind of thing in the bull breed world that that I've noticed that I I'm finding even in my little small niche that I'm trying to enter. Uh, how do I operate even in this way? Because I feel the same way as, as you do. Uh, but I also have another opinion that there needs to be some risks that I might need to take and some different avenues that I might need to explore. But I think going back to what I first said, people don't look at that as a business and they're not thinking outside the box. Uh, let's say they don't have the property, the huge property, and they don't have the huge pocketbooks, they, they're going to have to start in a way to build themselves up into that position to be able to do something. And it may never look like what they think is a successful breeding program, but it may look a little different. And you could still reach a goal and attain something without pumping out puppies that are, 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 shitty and unhealthy and i think there isn't that there isn't this happy medium in the bull breed world and i and i find like it's it's the shitty backyard breeders and then it's the elitists and it's everybody in between is the ones that get shit on and they don't really they don't really know which way to go and and both sides are are not are are not really 
and aren't really interested in dealing with the people in the middle. And that's where I have a little bit of a frustration when I'm looking for breeding prospects and wanting to work with quality breeders. And they don't, you know, I've, I've had a handful of people that have taken a chance I, on me and everything else, but most has been just about trying to get as much money as they can out of me on the front door. And I've realized I'm not going to play that game. So, um, especially since I've, I've, I have been willing to do some of the things given up a lot in the, in, in some regards, but so it's just one of those things where, where I'm having a hard time maneuvering in this, in this realm. And, and, um, I don't know where, how we can get quality, more quality people involved, uh, because, uh, there's just there's just two sides not not really willing to budge. It's the it's the greeters, the backyard breeders, and it's the elitists who don't want to deal with in, anybody but the people like themselves. Right. Yeah. No, I agree with you. It's definitely a problem. I mean, I I have a few people that I work with, you know, and I, and I do help them, and they've got my dogs. Um, but I need to know them well, uh, you know, and they have to, and, and basically I know it sounds, um, kind of bossy, but they need to do what I say, you know, they need to be willing to do what I tell them to do because I, I'm, I am not going to recreate the wheel. I mean, I've had thousands of litters. I mean, I've been doing this a long time. I'm not saying that your type T Y P E dog has to be the same as mine. I'm not saying that. Because you might want a little bigger dog or a little smaller dog or a little wrinkly dog or what, you know, I'm good with that. But structure is structure, okay? I don't care if it's a, a 45-pound dog. I don't care if, if it's a Pekingese, if it's a Rottweiler, if it's a dog should not be east-west, period. End of story, no matter what breed it is. So, you know, you, you, you can't come to me and say, well, the dog is a little bit east-west. It's okay to breed it. No, no. It's not. Well, if he's a little cow hawked, that's okay. No, no. Well, if he has a little skin problem, then that's okay. No. <laughs> so again, I mean, this is where there's certain criteria that I'm like, if this is how it comes out, the dog needs to go. And you have to be willing to say, okay, that dog goes away. You know, and that's where people, or you want to make it a pet, that's fine. You can spay or neuter the dog and keep it as a pet. Like, I'm okay with that. But the dog doesn't get bred. Um, you know, because that person's now linked to me and I don't want those dogs to be like one of the, I've got a real good friend of mine that I, I help her and we've been breeding for about four years together. Um, but she's not going to go buy another dog and buy that dog and breed it to my line because you're going to ruin my line. So we're going to stick with my dogs. And if you buy a female, then you're going to breed that female back to one of my stud dogs. And so, yeah, so for a while, it's going to be my way because I'm going to help you, you know, and then obviously I'm, I'm going to, you know, I want to hear what you, your outcome is. And if you want it to be a little taller, a little shorter, a little bigger, a little, I mean, but structure, structure, you know, if it's, you don't want that wide of a chest, I mean, I particularly like them wide, but I get that. Not everybody does. I mean, there's varieties there. I mean, the rose ear, maybe you don't want that. You may be a little more of a loppy or whatever. I mean, okay with that, but like a, a jaw that's wry, a crooked jaw. No. No. Goodbye. The dog goes away. Okay. He's got, he's got F hips. His freaking hips are like this. No, the dog goes away. I mean, it's, it's those particular things that I've run into problems with that, um, they don't want, they want to listen to their vet more than me. And I just go, you know what? I, I can't, I can't, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and argue with you because I give you breeding rights. So that's, that's just a tiny little piece of the problems, but I agree with you. It is a problem you have, but that's, it's almost kind of a life problem, isn't it? It's sort of the, the, you know, the haves and haves nots, right? It's like the middle class are the ones that are getting nailed the worst, you know, the poor, 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 and then the rich, 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 right? And, and I've tried to help people, you know, I've, I've tried to do my best and, um, and I'm willing to, you know, to, to, you know, to do it again. But, but to be honest, to be quite frankly, you you better bring something to the table. You, I need to know your life story. I need to know your background. I need to know what you're going to do and moving forward, how we're going to do it together. And in the beginning, it's going to be about 85% me. 
and you got to do what I say and you got to advertise like I say, and you got to, cause you're part of me, you're part of black horse bulldog. So it needs, you need to look to look and walk to talk and do, do it that way for now. And then I'll cut you loose. You know, I'll, I'll eventually cut you loose. And at least you, at least now I, after that period of time, I'll, I'll feel like you have enough knowledge and understanding that you can not be kennel blind. Right. And not say, you know what? I like that dog. He's got a big head, but he's cow hawked. Well, I don't give a damn how big his head is. He's cow hawked. He needs to go, right? Or he's got a straight stifle. He needs to go. And you have to be willing to do that. And that's probably the biggest thing that people grow attached to the dog, right? And they don't want to give the dog away. Um, And if you have a big place, you can keep him. But if you don't, you can't keep him intact because one, he's going to accidentally breed one of your females. And two, that male dog, if let's just say it's a male dog, um, he's going to cause problems with your other males. And that's a fact. Or even a bitch that's not spayed, they're going to fight because this breed fights for sure. So again, I mean, and then you, like you said, it's best to do it as a business. Then you got to feed that dog. So the dogs that aren't being bred, you can keep a pet or two, but if they're not your pet or two, they need to go. You know, if you want to get somewhere and I don't care if it takes you 10 years to get there. I mean, I'm all right with that. I'm not saying, like you said, you you don't have to have lots of litters in order to get there. I mean, it's slow and steady wins the race for sure. (laughs) For sure. This is no hurry. So, but that's, those are the people that I've helped. Um, Like I said, it might sound a little bossy, but, um, or a little pushy, but I, I know this and I know what to do. I've done it for so long. I'm not saying I'm, I'm not willing to hear, you know, a different way of doing it. I mean, even my employees, I tell them all the time. I'm like, listen, guys, tell me if you think we should do it a different way. Absolutely. I'm open. I'm open to it. Just let me know, you know, and I, I, I definitely have an amazing ability to think very far ahead down the road to see what's going to happen. Possibly. I have a pretty good instinct of that. But I'm certainly willing to learn other ways. I love learning. There's no question that's probably why I love animals the most is uh, they're so funny and silly and quirky and you learn something new every day. Every day I go, well, I didn't know that. (laughs) So, yeah. Yeah. Talk about how important, why it's so important for a bulldog to have good rear angulation and why is it, why is it that... Um, that has been such a um, difficult thing that in, in English is in old English is where it's just kind of a forgotten thing. Yeah, it's yeah, sadly, it's really forgotten. And again, it's form to function. You know, it, the dog starts in the rear and it has to move forward. You know, he's got to be able to carry that head and carry that chest you know, even if he doesn't have big bone, okay, because I don't, I don't, again, don't claim to, 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 to breed big bone dogs either. Um, I want a balanced dog, top to bottom, front to back, right? Like that's what a show dog is. Um, but rears is, to me, that's, that's just, a, that's a major starting point. Because if you have a good angulation, if you have a good stifle, if you have a good top line, um, then the dog can sit down, lift his front end up and drive forward because this breed is supposed to be a functioning breed. It's supposed to be a working breed. You know, there's, there are many, I do know two people, um, friends of mine that do pig hunt. Um, and they also, uh, do, they work cows and they work sheep and they work goats and they're old English work. And there's no way that dog could get down in his front and or, and get into that cow or get into that pig if he doesn't have a good rear. He doesn't have a good stifle and if he doesn't have good hips. So, I mean, that's a massive piece. I mean, that to me, that's, that's way more important than a big head. Um, and luckily, thank goodness, actually, um, 70% of the weight of the dog is carried up front. It is. So the, you can have a dog with bad hips. You can, and the dog can actually function well, um, but not a breeding prospect, not a breed dog. Again, I mean, weight pulling is a huge piece in this breed as well. I mean, weight pulling, it, that's an, another awesome thing. Um, if the dog doesn't have that good angulation, he's not going to be able to sit down and put his chest into it and pull. So, you know, I'm all for that. You know, I'm all for the breed being able to function. Now, again, most people say, well, I just want a nice pet in my house. That's true. 
a hundred percent. But if you're playing frisbee with your dog, if you're playing in the pool with your dog, if you're he's he's doing the fl- the flirt pole, if he's jumping up and doing grab and pull on on a tree, uh, uh, he has to be able to jump straight up and jump back down, jump straight up and jump back down, and not tear his ACL, right? So that's, that's a huge piece, you know, or not, not have a, have a stifle problem as a result of that. Um, so yeah, hips are my thing because I, I don't want a dog to be able to limp off, um, because he, he's posty in the rear. There's no question that you're, you're shortening the lifespan. Why? So wh- how do you shorten the lifespan of a dog that has a straight stifle? Well, here's why. If his stifle is straight, he's not going to want to walk much because now his stifle hurts or his hips hurt, or his lower gaskin hurts, right? Or his ankles hurt because he's too posty in the rear to run and play and jump. Or if he ran around and played and jumped too much, again, now he's got pain there. He's got arthritis there because he doesn't have a good angulation in the rear. So now now what does that dog do? He now sits on the couch a lot and he now becomes a couch potato, right? So now for the next three or four years, he doesn't do a whole lot because he hurts, right? His rear hurts, his stifle hurts, his, he's got issues in the hawk, right? So now he becomes more of just a, a dog that sits on the couch and goes to the walk twice a day. That's not what he was bred for, right? Now he's getting fatter and fatter, right? Because owners are unfortunately not responsible in not letting their dogs be fat, that's a major problem. And then he gets fatter and fatter. Then now, you, again, you understand where I'm going? You're shortening the lifespan of the dog, hugely, because he now becomes a couch potato, because he's now being fed and he's not getting walked enough because he doesn't want to walk because he hurts in the rear, right? Or in his stifle or in his hawk, right? So again, this is why down the road, people need to think about how they breed. Um, because of that's to me, longevity. And then the dog lives to be oh, eight or nine. Well, that doesn't work for me. Eight or nine years old is way too young for this breed. David Levitz created that breed to be, you know, at least 12 to 13. But if he, if he's got good joints and, and tight feet, straight front, uh, he's not East West. He's not cow hawking the He's not long backed. He doesn't have a, a high croup. Uh, you know, he's got a good barrel on his chest. I mean, all these things. So the head doesn't play a role in that. You see how big his head is, isn't playing a role in that. You see? So that's why for me, I'm not saying I wouldn't, I don't like a big, nice head head. I like cheeks. Cheeks are my thing. I like big jowls, a big cheek on a dog, not a big head. He can have a medium head with big cheeks because that tells me his bite's good. Um, you know, that, that to me is what I like, but yes, that is why. I, I like all kinds and I like a proportionate dog, so it could have a medium head, but on, on a smaller body. So it may look like it has a big head, you know, that sort of thing. So I like all different kinds of variations as long as it's, uh, got a healthy start. That's my, that's my biggest my biggest thing um what a, just uh an 18 inch dog how much should it weigh um again it depends on the bone of the dog if he's got a really good bone you know 85 pounds um right around 80 to 85 pounds with good bone you know you know you can fix bone you can make bone bigger you know that's the piece is that it's incredibly difficult to fix rye jaw it's incredibly difficult to fix east-west. It's incredibly hard to fix a rear. So head is easy to make. I can make a head. Uh, I can make a chest. Um, but the rear is hard and the east-west is hard. You can't breed that out, man. It'll come back to bite you. Grandparents and great-grandparents plays a massive role moving forward in dogs. Huge, huge role. So I show people parents and grandparents so they understand what they're getting. So that's a major piece. Um, so yeah, that's that's how I, that's how I how I breed. Yeah, you got it so dialed in with your bloodlines, you don't have to. It's it's oldie versus too oldie to oldie, or or do you ever go into an outcross for a certain reason? No, I've done outcrosses. I I've done outcrosses. I I bought um, a beautiful, amazing American bulldog uh, from um, Brazil. Um, and from, uh, awesome breeder over there. And, um, and I put it in the line, I needed some, some size and needed some bone. 
And the bitch that I bought was 90 pounds, big girl. Um, nice dog, really nice dog. She ended up being an awesome part of my program, my chocolate line. I put that, that, that girl into the red line. And again, you know, I, I had no idea, you know, what's going to happen. Like I said, you're throwing it at the wall and see what sticks and see how it goes. I mean, you can have an amazing stud dog, but he doesn't throw himself. He just doesn't. He just does not throw himself or you, or I mean, vice versa. You can have an amazing bitch, but the grandparents pick up. So yes, um, I, I'll do American Bulldogs and I've done American Bulldogs in the line. I was fortunate because Karen Beal line bred and inbred, um, American Bulldogs to make oldies. That's what she did. That's how she, she, I mean, Brinks, um, world famous champion, dual champion Brinks, Taurus Bulls Brinks. She bred two American Bulldogs together to make that dog. And it was an inbreed. And it came out awesome. And so, um, again, it, it, line breeding, type breeding, and inbreeding is very good if, if you've got years and years behind it. Because it's only going to come out two ways. It's going to become, it's going to become, it'll come out a total shit, shithole, a total clusterfuck. <laughs> and you get rid of all of them and you put them all on the ground. Or it's going to be awesome, 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 awesome. And I was fortunate enough on the red line that with Karen, she had already done a ton of that work before I got some of the red dogs. Um, so yeah, so, um, so to answer your question, I don't put English bulldog in. Um, I've done it once in 37 years. I did one English bulldog. I do have one English bulldog that I do breed, AKC English bulldog. Um, I do have uh, uh, some customers that come to me and they're like, Miss Karen, I love your oldies. They're awesome. We love that. But we take, we're a retired couple. You know, we don't need an energetic dog. We don't want to go to the dog park. We just want a, a really awesome, wonderful bulldog. So I said, all right, I guess, let me see how I can improve the AKC world. And I did, I have done that. So I have two, um, really nice AKC English bulldogs, but they run, they jump, they play on my farm. They do not make a breathing noise. I x-rayed the hips, the elbows, the trachea. Okay. Uh, they have, they, their nose is against their septum. They are very wrinkly, but they can function. That's my thing. Like I'm fine with you having, um, a, a short nose, but you better be able to go do, a, um, a three mile run in August at noon down here in Florida. Otherwise I don't breed you period end story. That's it. That's my standard. If the dog is struggling to breathe, I don't breed the dog. And, and really you can go and take an x-ray, which I've done tons of times, take an x-ray, um, of the side view of the dog and see that the trachea is bigger. And then it gets more narrow down as it goes into the lungs. Then when the dog jumps and runs and plays or has an anxiety attack, that's when that trachea is now closing off, man. That's when it's getting smaller and tighter. And that's when the dog overheats and or dies. So I disagree. Everybody thinks that it's the nares that's making it a good breathing dog. It's a piece, but in my opinion, in my experience with all my years and all my dogs, I've had long nose dogs. I mean, like we're talking pit bull terrier nose dogs. They breathed terrible, terrible. I've had very short nose dogs. Their nose are against their septum. Okay. They breathe awesome. It's a trachea. Okay. It's that trachea, not necessarily the, the nasal passages. Yes. You want open nares. Okay. I'm not saying you don't want nice wide open nares, um, and a little longer nose for that for many other reasons, but in the end, it's going to be that trachea, not necessarily, um, the, the nose. And I, to this day, I don't know any of my dogs that have, have had trachea surgery to my knowledge. Um, if I did, I would, that would be a major problem for me. Yeah. In the end, people want to sell, people want to breed to sell their puppies. They don't want to breed to, you know, and, and that, they, and I understand that because, you know, my red line is more drivey. So I have to be very careful where I sell that to and where that goes. You know, I will not sell a red line dog to somebody that, you know, is not ready for that. So that's a problem because people just want to sell their dogs. They just want to be able to get rid of them. And the majority of them just need to make a dollar, right? So that's where it's, it is more difficult. You know, um, it, it is a, 
uh, it's a catch 22. Um, but, but you, you also have to know, and the only way you know, this is through a big breeder, like say myself, is you have to know what's recessive and what's dominant, right? What you can breed out and what you cannot, um, when to, when to call the dog and when to send it down the road as a pet, you know, but that's the problem. That's the million dollar question right there is everybody has a different opinion about what they think is breedable, right? And what isn't a big deal, shall we say? Well, he's a little bit east-west. Well, that's like saying you're a little pregnant. You are or you're not, you know? <laughs> I mean, so if the dog's east-west, he's east-west and he needs to go. That's it, even if it's a little bit. But that's my opinion. But most people go, well, you can work with that. No, because that's definitely not recessive. That's dominant. And you will never breed out east-west. You're not, you, it's just, it's really going to, it'll come back to bite you every single time. So I don't breed it, man. I, I just don't. My Frenchies are the same way, you know, it, it, and it takes a long time and it's very expensive. So that's where it's not about, you know, breeding them together and making a couple of bucks with puppies. And that's where, you know, that middle class, shall we say, in between people, um, have to have another job, have to have something else in order to be able to move forward in their dogs. Because the, if you think you're just going to breed, you know, have five litter, and that's why I stopped doing it. They've had five litters. Now they think they know it all right now. They think they got it all down. And I'm like, Oh, for the love of God, <laughs> I just, I just can't like, I'm like, I'm out. I can't, I, I'm like, <laughs> I can't even, I can't work with that, you know? So that's what I mean when I say you have to do exactly what I say. And when I see the structure of the dog, I mean, not only do I know dogs, but I know I, I bred horses. I raised horses. I rode horses. You know, there's a big difference between being a horse trainer, right, and someone who can ride horses and someone who's a horse show judge, being able to sit behind the stand and judge. I do all three. That is my gift. I have the gift. That is my gift from God. I'm able to feel it, smell it, see it uh, in every regard. I, I just am. I'm, that's what I'm good at. So I'm the same in my dogs. If I can look at that dog and see how he moves, and I'll go, that's not a good moving dog. He needs to go because he moves like an elephant. Or he's got, he, he, he doesn't have the swing in the rear that needs to be functional. Same with my Frenchies. You know, they have to, there's a, there's a way that they're supposed to track and they're supposed to gate. So again, that's just the way I am, but I'm not saying I'm better than anybody else. I'm just saying I stay in my lane. I do what works for me. And I'm really lucky that I've had Karen and we, we were a great team. So, but yeah, it, it, it's a tough, you're right. It's really tough to have that in between, shall we say middle-class, um, people that are trying to help. And, and I help people and I have helped people. And they're appreciative of it. Um, but to get one of my dogs, it's not that I've got fancy dogs. It's not about that. It's just about I've worked so hard to get my dogs where they're at. I don't want them wrecked. I don't want it ruined, I guess. That's the thing. I don't, especially my redline dogs. You know, I'm willing to try um, to do some different things to see how it goes. I mean, I am. Um, the health of the dog has to be there because there's no perfect dog. I get that. I do. I understand that there's not perfect, but there has to be those dominant traits that are not bred again. And you have to be willing, no matter what you paid for the dog, no, how much, no matter how much you have in the dog money wise, you have to be willing to go, well, it's not a breed dog and that's it and start again. And that's what most people just can't do. They, they can't, they either can't afford to do it or they don't want to do it. And that's, that's the difference. Yeah, it's going to, it's for me, it's going to be, um, I mean, yes, genotype and phenotype are two different things, but I look more at genotype than I do phenotype. I, I, I want to see the dog. I need to see the dog. I need to put my eyes on the dog. Um, and then I need to see what he produces. You know, that's if it's a stud dog, for example, because there's a lot of really awesome studs out there, but they don't throw themselves. So um, again, that's a piece. Uh, the percentages, I don't, I don't, I definitely don't breed off of pedigree. I definitely breed off of, of what I see. And then I keep track of what's behind the dog to see what it is. Um, and then obviously most definitely the highest priority is health for me. You know, if I, um, uh, if that, none of those dogs have to carry anything, like nothing, they have to be clear on both sides. They can't carry one copy of HUU or one copy of, of like in my Frenchies, you know, vertebrae, they can't carry that at all. 
No way. Because as animal genetics has taught me, you can have all clear dogs and still have a Frenchie with a spinal problem, right? They can still have a vertebrae problem. So, um, because it's still, it's in the breed, it's there, even though, and I've had it happen. I have had it happen. I've had a dog had, had, um, HUU and it was clear five generations back on both sides. And they still, the, the puppy at four months old got HUU and, and I'm like, really? It's craziness because, and because the tests aren't a hundred percent guaranteed when they do the test. It's not like human testing. It's different. So it's got to be clear all the way back. I want it. I just want it back. And like I said, it's a lot of controversy on health testing dogs because, because it's not a guarantee. But again, in, at the end of my day, I have to go to bed at night knowing that I try to do everything I could in my power to make sure that I produce the healthiest dog, aside from showing, aside from a working dog, you know, aside from that, in the end, you, me, everybody in the world wants a pet that they can love and snuggle and take care of and not watch them suffer. It's the suffering that nobody wants to see. That's the bottom line in, in all of this. It's not the color, it's not the head size, it's not the structure, it's not, it's not any of that. It's gonna be the suffering that that dog or the short of the, the shortness of the lifespan of that dog. The dog lived to be six years old and he died of cancer. Oh, if there's anything that I can do to prevent that, I'm gonna do that. That's my goal. Because I don't, I don't, I don't want to see people cry. I don't that hurts my heart. And in the end, I I am, I know how to be able to breed dogs and and wrap my heart. Uh, a, a big gigantic plastic wrap around my heart so I don't get my heart hurt from breeding. But at the same time, uh, you have to be so, you have to have so much compassion and love for, for animals to know that you don't want them to suffer. So in the end, that's my 100% go-to is I'm, I'm doing all that I can. And I don't have perfect dogs by no means, but in the end, I'm trying to make that. I mean, I, I, I don't want to see a Frenchie um, slowly um, uh, have, have uh, be paralyzed from the back to the front because he's got a vertebrae problem. I don't want that. Really, nobody wants that. So structure aside, that that's a piece, you know. And can you help that? Yeah. Of course, the show industry is not helping it because they want a short back Frenchie. They want to freaking the shortest back dog out there. But yet, when you X-ray that, let me tell you, it's a. It's a when you X-ray that Frenchie and you see his 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 vertebrae and his his ribs on top of each other when you X-ray it. I mean, that's what's hard about it is the show industry. And this is if every show, and I know a lot of people that show ABKC, AKC, BBCR, OBBA, AB, BBC, ABCR, I know all the associations, ABKC, I know them all because I'm, I'm in them all. And in the end, what's showing isn't what's functioning. That's the problem. That's the truth. And that's why... I veered away from showing um, quite a bit lately because I'm just not going to give money to those associations and promote just because they want a big dog. Well, so what? He's big. Well, I don't care if he's big. What's it, that? Doesn't that doesn't help me, right? So again, I don't need to prove to this person or that person that my dog is good because he's a championship. All I have to do is post up a picture of the front and the back of the dog, and you see the balance and the structure, and you know what he is. I don't need the judge to tell me that. So again, I mean, that's a major problem in showing is that what is functioning out there, like it's a, if it's a bird dog, right? A hunting dog is not what's winning in the show arena. And that's sad. So talk about the, you have the red line and what is the other lines that you have? And, and you talk, maybe the red line is a little more, uh, you know, a little more uh, hot, so to speak. So is there a, is that why you have maybe more than one line? Um, yeah, the red line is, um, that comes from Karen's line. And Karen, Karen, I mean, old English bulldogs are guard dogs, right? They are supposed to guard you, guard your family, guard your house, guard your fence, guard your door. I mean, they're guard dogs. Then you have more of a drive your line that is, is meant um, to work, right? Pig hunt, um, weight pulling, you know, they're, they're, and so that's another piece. They have, all these have a mind, right? They're not going to wake up in the morning and sit on the couch. They're going to wake up in the morning and go, what are we doing? What are we doing? What are we doing? Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. That's an oldie. 
So again, it's fine as long as you're able to understand that mind and do something with it, you'll be okay. But then you have what I call my red line. <laughs> These dogs are extremely drivey. They'll chase your vacuum, your, your, your kid if it's running. Um, if you pull your hand away, they'll jump at your hand, not because they're trying to bite you, because they like to chase. They're chase dogs, their prey drive, dr prey drive is very high. Um, you have to be careful with it because if you, uh, I teach people that don't let their little children run with the dog because then they'll chase their kid and that's not good. So, you know, I've had some problems in the red line because they're just too drivey. So, um, inbreeding, line breeding, and type breeding is good because they all come out the same, but I've had to make sure that I don't breed two drivey dogs together. So what I actually did this past time is I put my Einstein line, who's, who's 11 years old, three-time champion Einstein Jr., my Lilac Tri-Boy. Um, I put my, one of my Einstein sons into my red line to tap it down, to bring down the drive. The structure is the same. I made it a little shorter, a little smaller, and then I tapped it down for the drive because it was people were just having a hard time because people are not dog trainers, okay? They're not. So remember, I mean, obviously we have to place them in homes to stay in homes, not to bounce around from home to home, right? And I'll always take the dog back, but I don't want to have problems or issues. So um, that's really important to me that the dog stays there. So in my Einstein line, I've just recently, just this six months ago, and I just did it again, I put my, I put my Einstein um, junior son, Einstein son, Einstein junior son, bingo, and Mr. Captain into the red line. And it worked out great, actually. I could tell immediately when those pups were seven and eight weeks old, um, they didn't have that drive as, as the red line does have. Um, so again, um, it, it, yeah, that's really important in that. So I have my Einstein line, which is also that. Um, and then my third line that I have is actually uh, a dog that, that's name is, is um, from Titanium Bulldogs. Um, um, it's a very old school line that goes back many years from the beginning. Also, um, his name is Asland and he's 10. Now um, he's a hundred pounds. He's a big dog, um, really large dog, really like him. Uh, um, again, it goes back to the very beginning, uh, line that, uh, that David Love has tried to create. I don't use him as much just because I bred him into the red line. That it did not work. Nope, 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 nope. That just didn't work. Health was great. The health of all of my dogs is is awesome. I have I've had I'll be honest I've had very little health issues, very little hip problems, elbow problems because of all the health testing. I think that's helped me dramatically. The plus I think the other major piece that's helped me through the years is I board and train my dogs I sell, so I get to see what I what I'm producing because I encourage people to bring their dogs back to board and train. Um, you can health test all day long, but the only way you know is just put eyes on that dog. So I'm definitely more, you know, about seeing the dog um, and, and, that, uh, uh, and to see the personality, the temperament, how he moves, his build, I mean, all of that. To me, that's really important. And I have people that drive two, three hours when they go on vacation and they bring me their dog. And I love that. And I'm 35 bucks a day, I'm like dirt cheap, but it benefits me because I get to see my dog, yeah? Then I can see what I'm producing. Then I can go, well, that worked out or that didn't, you know? So that's another piece that I've done is because I have a big place and I board, um, I've been able to do that. That's helped me also in my program. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So those are my three lines that I have. And then of course I've been doing Frenchies for the last 10 years now and I'm loving my Frenchies, just loving that. That's been, um, and I only want, you know, show quality Frenchies. That's all I've had, just top of the line. Again, but function. They have to function. They got they 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 have to breathe. They have to run, jump, play. They gotta chase squirrels in a hundred degree weather. All of my dogs had to be outside, swimming pond out back in a hundred degrees. If they don't, I don't keep the dog. The dog goes. That's the way I do it. it Talk, what is the perception or the reception that you've gotten lately in, in the show world today that's kind of frustrated you with some of your dogs? Because I've heard several people in the breed, even from some jo show judges, that they're less concerned of uh, movement 
uh, th- than they are type. They keep using this word type or typey or whatever that word is, and and they're they they um, they say that the movement isn't is just secondary. It, it, so, what is the perception of your dogs nowadays, and 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 how is how do you? foresee the next few years with with these new style of um extreme structured dogs well unfortunately first of all and i'm not going to say any associations but um a lot of these associations these bulldog associations they don't have educated judges they don't they don't know. I've had many judges come up to me and say to me, Miss Karen, can you tell me again what the standard of the oldie is? Because I'm not really sure. Are you kidding me right now? You don't know the standard of an oldie. They're just not educated on it. And I think we need to be more tighter and more specific about educating the judges and making sure that they know what the breed is exactly, specifically. Um, And I think, in my opinion, movement should be huge. I mean, if you read the standard of an old English bulldog, he's supposed to breathe well. And do you know how many shows that I've gone to with the dog in front of me or behind me is going, (laughs) he can't breathe. Now, if you've been to a show, you'll know at a show that's indoors, it's about 62 degrees in that show arena. It's really cold. And yet that dog in front of me and that dog behind me can't breathe worth a damn. And yet he wins. How, how is that? So yeah, or he has loose skin or he has splayed feet because he's got a big head or he's a big dog. Really? Again, you know, I just, that's why, like I said, I pull back on my showing with several of the associations. I like my the one that I like and I I do talk about a lot that I go to is a Becca. It's the International All Breed Canine, and the reason I go to them and the reason I show with them and I like them is because they there's a, the judges there. There's probably not a judge younger than 68. <laughs> they're they're not. They're old school judges. Most of them are AKC judges, and they see all different kinds of working dogs, not just bulldogs, which I love. So they're all about structure and movement. Type is third. And I agree with that. I think type is third. I think I think movement and structure is first. And I think type is, is third. That's just my opinion. Because again, ty, um, type is important. I'm not saying that it isn't. It has to look like an old English bulldog. I'm not saying it isn't. But just because he has a big head, but he's got, he's got, a, a very tight front um, elbows. And as a result of his elbows being very tight, his front assembly is a mess and the dog doesn't move well because if his shoulders are tight, I mean, his, his elbows are tight, his front assembly is gonna swing and it's gonna throw him east west. So that, I don't care what, how typey the dog is, right? If he's got a bad front assembly, he needs to not win. But there's many dogs and this even blows, I'll blow a gasket. That's why I just can't go to a lot of these bully shows anymore is because they have a posty rear. Oh, they can't, I can't even, I just can't. I'm like, I can't look. I, I'm, I just can't even look. He's got a straight stifle, but he's got a big old head on him and he's got, and he's got big bone. He's got splayed feet and he moves like, uh, basically like an elephant and he wins. I just, I can't, I, I, I can't, I, 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 it's, so that's why I've just, unfortunately, I don't like the direction we're heading in. And it's because the judges that are being put, put up to judge are not qualified judges. They're not. That's why I like Obeka. That's why I've been going to them. I like them. And, um, they, they know all breeds of dogs and they're all about movement and structure and type is third, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, if somebody from the outside looking in, I'm 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 pretty skeptical of the of the show world on many levels. So, um, I like the idea of it and the the purpose behind the the idea of the show world. Um, it just it just isn't something that I would I I would partake in because of just 
all the things that you know you've you, you've talked about and and you know if you know this is your your business so you you have to and and this is something that that you know this what is what fuels your you know your passion and all that so i get it i'm not shitting on that at all but um it's just for me from the outside looking in i just i'd rather just be around quality people that are trying to breed healthy dogs that are going to make families happy and um kind of give a give certain aspects of that wow factor where i'm going to take a second glance and for me it's that structure and that's that's function and, and athleticism and it doesn't matter if the dog's a clydesdale or he's a, a thoroughbred i i like i like them both well you can the, the people i get this misconception all the time people are like why well, want a big dog he can move better i'm like that's not true my Frenchies are tiny little dogs and they move awesome. And my small line off of Einstein is can freaking move way better than my big dog. So that's not true. That is a fallacy. It's going to be the balance of the dog. It's going to be, you know, how he single tracks from the back to the front. So that is not true. You're wrong about that. Just because he's big doesn't mean he's more athletic. Absolutely. I mean, Mr. Captain, you know, my silver lilac tribe boy. He, he's, he's 70 pounds and he's 16 inches tall. And that dog can jump straight up in the air 20 times, straight up in the air. He can scale a four foot fence standing still like a deer, right over, like a deer. Four feet, four feet, right over, boom. And he's, he's 16 inches tall, that dog. And I've seen him do it 10 times. He'll look at me and go, whoop, like a deer, right over the fence. I'm like, you're shitting me right now, dog. He doesn't even touch the fence. He does it like a deer, it's amazing. So again, but that tells me he's got awesome hips because that socket can rotate all the way back and go in. I don't even have to x-ray the hips to know that, see? So if they can jump straight up and down, up and down, up and down, straight up and down 10 times, that socket can roll all the way back and roll all the way back and it doesn't come out of that socket, see? If it comes out, then it's a problem. So if he can do that all day long and he doesn't have any pain, I don't even have to x-ray the hip. I mean, you, you can look at a dog that moves. If he goes lateral, he has bad hips. Hips aren't good because that means that that socket is coming out. So most of the time I can see a dog gait and tell you if he has good hips or not. I can see him play and run and jump because I've, I've seen dogs with bad hips. My dogs, like I said, I'm not saying I have perfect dogs. I can look at him and go, I don't think his hips are good. And sure enough, I'll x-ray him and go, I was right. I was right. Hips were, were, were D hips and the dog got a home because I'm not, not going to breed a D hip dog. So again, I mean, it, 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 and it is true. And that, again, this is where it comes back to. Everybody has a different idea of what's important to breed. And I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying this is what I do. Because in, in the, like I said, the bottom line of this whole entire thing for me is at the end, there's two things. I love my artwork that I create because it's so much work. It's so much money. It's so much time that I get to look at my artwork walk. Like that's my goal every day. Cause I love that. And two, I want to put dogs in homes that, that live as long as possible that people love and they stay away from the vet. If you read my website, that's a second, second sentence on my website. I'm trying to keep you out of the vet. That's my goal as best I can. And bulldogs are not, do not have good all everything all the way around so that's those are my two things yeah oh fay or pin hip and why um i've done both you know the, the problem with you uh, i'd probably say ofa um only because i feel like the people that i've dealt with through ofa and i've called them and talked to them i felt like they were more honest with me I felt like pin hip when I did pin hip, they, they were just sort of quickly trying to get me off the phone and didn't want to spend time with me and didn't really want to educate me when I first started years ago. Um, and I didn't feel like pin hip was, what is as accurate. Um, they really want OFA wants really, really, really solid x-rays. Um, and you know, OFA won't give you a whole lot of great until the dogs too. I mean, they'll do a preliminary, right? But they don't do a whole lot until the dog is two years old to really give you a solid concrete, whatever, because I'm here to tell you, I've probably done, oh my God, I don't know, 200, 200 hips, at least, if not more in my time. Uh, and it changes. It does. 
you know, it, it's, that's why people don't do it. That's why they're like, well, I'm not going to do it because it's, again, it's, it depends. This is true. I'm not going to lie. It does depend. It depends on who takes the x-ray. It depends on, is the dog sedated? It depends on the age of the dog. It depends on the positioning of the hips on the x-ray of the dog. Um, it depends on what that dog has done from zero to a year old. Has he been run jumping and playing and jumping off of high places where his hips have not been well? Um, how he was whelped. I, I'm a firm believe in how you whelp that litter from day one uh, affects the hips of, of, that, the, the, of, that, of that puppy, of that dog. Um, you know, I've, I've had it all over. I'll be perfectly honest. I've x-rayed hips at, at uh, 11 months that were rock solid awesome. They were A hips. And then I x-ray them again at two and they were like Bs. I'm like, really? Wow. Okay. And I've had it flip the other way. I'm like, yay, yay, yay. So, I mean, but in the end, I'm looking for, you know, B hips. I'm not looking for D and F hips. It's not going to get bright. I, that It's going to go away because that doesn't change. So, and of course, anything that is, you know, uh, a loose hip or dysplastic is, uh, that's just not going to get bright. No. So that's, yeah, to answer your question, I, I'm more so OFA.